this week on the show. The sinkholes left behind by the shrinking Dead Sea. It's this devastation, but it's also quite beautiful, isn't it? Travel tech you can talk to. I've packed it. Can you say it again? And I'm in Mexico to see one of the world's most impressive migrations. First up this week, we're in the resort of Ein Gedi in Israel on the banks of the Dead Sea. This vast, salty lake is one of the region's top tourist attractions, but it's one that's slowly disappearing, leaving behind a scarred landscape, which we sent Joe Wally to explore. This is the lowest point on Earth and people come here from all over the world to experience the surreal sensation of floating about in the hyper-salty waters. But in recent years, the Dead Sea has been shrinking back at a rate of more than a metre a year. The phenomenon's been caused by a sharp decrease in the amount of water flowing into it. As the country is along the River Jordan, the Dead Sea's main source harness its flow for industry and farming. 30 years ago, the Dead Sea came all the way up here, right to these beach umbrellas. But now the sea's receded so much that tourists have to be bussed by tractor to the water's edge. It's a distance of more than a mile. The tractor rides might be a fun novelty for tourists, but they're expensive to run. And the shrinking sea has caused an even bigger problem. As the waters recede, huge underground salt deposits are left behind. And when the salt dissolves, the ground above it can collapse without warning, causing sinkholes. Yariv has seen the impact firsthand. This is the main road and the main beach and the main touristic place that used to be. I can see how the roads just all give way. Yeah, 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 everything just collapsing. Everything just uh, falling apart. Yeah. Two years ago, this road, which was one of the country's major highways, was closed and rerouted after the surface started to sink. It's now an enormous hole. It's crazy, it looks like an earthquake. It is, unfortunately it is, yeah. That's, uh, basically, that's what's going on. The, the ground is just falling apart. And it's all fractured. Yeah. Yeah. All the way down there. And it's still active. Everything's just collapsing into this hole. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of the, and this is relatively small. Or not, let's say not That's so big. That's a small one. Not so big, yeah. <laughs> it's not a big one, yeah. How many sinkholes are there now? Uh, around more than 6,000, 6,500, let's say, around 6,500. When did the first hole happen? The beginning of it was the late 80s. It was a phenomenon, nice one, interesting, uh, very interesting phenomenon. But it escalated very much and very fast. And um, once you bring people next to it, uh, people who live, people who work here, and touristic places, then you have to just leave the place and you get the biggest damage that you can, uh, they can get. This tourist resort used to be one of the Dead Sea's few public beaches. Two years ago, it had to be evacuated when the ground became too unstable. Wow. 
the whole buildings just had to be abandoned. Yeah. Yeah, in a short, very short notice, we have to just take everything, pack our bags, stuff, um, equipment, and just leave. It looks like a war. Storm. There is a plan to reverse the fortunes of the Dead Sea by pumping water into it from the Red Sea over a hundred miles away. But that could take many years and no one knows for sure if it will work. In the meantime, the people here are determined to rebuild, using satellite mapping to assess where new holes might open up. Um, actually, what you see there, like a big lagoon, is a chain of sinkholes. Eli Raz helped develop the satellite system. He's been studying the sinkholes for the past 17 years. So is it safe to explore this area? It is quite safe to somebody who knows where to go, somebody who knows the issue of the sinkholes. Uh, for somebody who doesn't know nothing at all, it could be dangerous. Ellie has started taking groups out to safely view the sinkholes. He wants something positive to come out of the problem. Um, first of all, uh, to raise the awareness of people to the Dead Sea crisis. But also, on the other hand, to give explanations. People are willing to know what's happening. And then we have also the other side, the bright side of the problem. And people are amazed by the scenery. It is beautiful. And that's why it is very important to let the people an access to the sea, a safe one. Nowadays, there is no any safe access. And uh, I think that uh, we are losing something. The idea is for people to be able to see the geological wonders that have appeared as the Dead Sea has receded. I just want to show you my diamonds. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. They are actually um, crystals, idiomorphic crystals of salt. Can I keep this? Yes, of course. This. Uh, <laughs> You know. Thank you very much. <laughs> A gift from... Uh, A gift from the Dead Sea. That's incredible. And it isn't just salt diamonds that have formed along the shore. Now here's the pearls. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, they form just when um, there is a slope and the waves roll them up and down. So. Diamonds and pearls. <laughs> Diamonds and pearls, yes. You're spoiling me. <laughs> it's amazing to be able to grab handfuls of these pearls. They're so beautiful. And is the, there a hole near here, a sinkhole? Uh, there, are, there are sinkholes, of course, all along the coastal plain. And can we go and have a look at one? Yes. OK, let's go then. Is that it? All of that? Yeah. This is one of the biggest sinkholes here. It's absolutely enormous. This is about uh, 40 metres, 50 metres in diameter. Wow. It's filled with water as well. This is the groundwater. I'm a bit scared here, Ali. Yes, I'm not, not being exactly tentative. sweet water, but with the ability to dissolve salt. Yeah. It's like a lagoon, isn't it? It's like a lagoon. It's such a lot to take in because it's this devastation, but it's also it's quite beautiful, isn't it? It is beautiful. Always it's better to look at the bright side of the problem. <laughs> yes. It's 
It's the eerie beauty of this place that is hoped can be used to attract more tourists to the area and repair some of the economic damage that's been caused by the sinkholes. If you're planning a trip to the Dead Sea, you don't need to worry about a sinkhole opening up under the beach. The affected areas are clearly signposted and shouldn't be entered without guidance from an expert. Still to come on The Travel Show? I'm in central Mexico to see one of the world's greatest wildlife migrations. Wow. Normally we're not allowed to get this close. So don't go away. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Where's the closest train station? Where's the closest pizza restaurant? What's the weather going to be like later? Voice activated tech has exploded in popularity in recent years with gadgets and apps that use speech command becoming a big part of our lives and our homes with little devices like this standing by as an in-house personal assistant. But now smart speakers want to change the way you travel before you've even packed your bags. Google Home has launched a packing assistant called Bebot that's been developed by airline KLM. I'm really intrigued to give this a go. OK, Google, talk to KLM. Where are you going? Tokyo. Shall we start packing? Yes. I've made a personal packing list for you that is perfect. Let's start with travel essentials such as your passport and bank cards. I've packed it. Make sure to pack enough underwear for seven days. Underwear, very important. Underwear. I've packed it. Make sure to pack enough underwear for seven days. I've packed it. I missed what you said. I've packed it. I missed what you said. I'm coming. Pack pants for seven days. I've packed it. I didn't get that. Can you say it again? I've Which packed it. <laughs> Sorry for asking, but are you a man or a woman? Woman. Pack enough skirts for seven days. I bring my sunglasses if I wear you. I've packed them. Marie, could you say that again? I've packed them. Sunglasses are in the bag. Just They're don't wear it. them at night. You're not the guy from that song. Have a good flight. Right, I'm all packed and good to go. So overall, I'd say BB is pretty helpful in making sure that you pack the essentials and you don't forget anything. But the entire process felt a little bit long-winded. You can't interrupt her when she's speaking. I couldn't find a way to go back. And after joke four or five, it got a little bit annoying. And yes, it's very cool that it uses artificial intelligence. It all feels very futuristic. But for now, I don't think I'm ready to give up a good old fashioned list. And other smart speakers are getting in on the travel act too. Matt's popped round to show me how Amazon's Alexa can help with flight and hotel searches. Welcome back. What would you like to do? Alexa, speak to Kayak. Search for flights to Paris. Please tell me when you want to fly out. In one week. When do you want to fly back to London? Return in two weeks. And off we go. The least expensive flight from London to Paris is a non-stop flight on EasyJet for £75. So it's a great way to get a kind of rough ballpark on the kind of figures you'll be paying to go on holiday, which is quite handy. Delivering that through voice, rather than actually having to kind of type it out and play with calendars and all of that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, and that kind of makes it really effortless as well, Absolutely. doesn't it? Absolutely. In the US right now, you can actually book your hotel. Uh, I, I, I just don't know how I feel about that. I need to see what I'm going to stay in. Don't people want to look at what they're investing their money in before they go on holiday? Well, I, I guess if you've been somewhere before, or if you, maybe you're feeling a little adventurous. I mean, yeah, if you like taking a few risks. Yeah, you know, if you've, if you've ever done a bit of traveling and you know, you just turn up to a random hotel or hostel and, and you know, you go on a local's word, maybe. So would you book your hotel through Alexa? I'm definitely gonna try it. And here's a speech activated gadget you can try out anywhere. The GoPro Hero 6 Black. When you're using your hands to, let's say, cycle or drive, or maybe you can't reach or touch the buttons on your camera, being able to bark commands at it in order to control it is an absolute godsend. All I have to say is GoPro, start recording.
So there are loads of commands at your disposal. You can get it to take photos, you can set it to shoot in burst mode, you can even record a time lapse. And if you think you filmed something that's particularly standout, you can get it to mark the clip at that exact moment by saying GoPro highlight, or if you're a bit down with the kids, that was sick. And when you want to stop filming, all you have to say is GoPro, stop recording. You wouldn't know what to look at, but these hills are just a couple hours drive from Mexico City, one of the world's biggest urban conurbations. This is the transatlantic volcanic belt, but it's not the volcanoes we've come to see. I'm almost to the summit of Bald Peak, and you can tell I'm quite out of breath. We are about 3,000 meters above sea level. The air is thin, it's quite cold, but we are beginning to see monarch butterflies. Every winter, millions of butterflies fly for around two months from Canada and the US to a few patches of high altitude forest here in Mexico. Most are located in the state of Michoacan, but this place is slightly east of there in Mexico state. Cerro Pelon is the least touristy site and somewhere you can truly be alone with these creatures. Wow. Normally we're not allowed to get this close, but from this distance, I hope you can see there are millions of monarchs clustered in black clumps on these fir trees. What I find absolutely amazing about this insect is they travel 4,000 kilometers from Canada, United States, down to this particular forest. It's the longest migration undertaken by any insect. Scientists only recently discovered that they use the sun to navigate these same few reserves every year, where they rest, feed, and then find a mate. In recent years, the populations have dwindled thanks to the destruction of habitats in the US and Canada and deforestation here in Mexico. One study says the numbers have gone down by 84% in the last 20 years. The fear is this, one more bad winter and the entire colony could be gone. It's been really bad, you know. Two years ago, we have uh, this snowstorm. They kill a lot of butterflies, you know. It was it was really really sad to see like um, to see these clusters, you know, the way we saw that they are. Mm -hmm. And 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 but those butterflies, they like dead, and they still like they look like they um, hibernating, but they're not hibernating anymore. They like just dead. They're frozen. Yeah, frozen because the weather. And what happens if there's another terrible winter like that? Well, I hope it will not be the end of the butterflies, you know, because it will be bad, you know, the, the population went down a lot. The village at the foot of the hill depends largely on the butterflies for its existence. It's tiny, though the people are instantly welcoming. <laughs> there is just one B&B &B run by Huel and his American wife Ellen, which they set up in an effort to make day trippers stay here for a bit longer. And wouldn't you know it, the one local restaurant is run by Puel's mom, Rosa. Yeah. You guys have an avocado. And why do you guys love the butterflies? Why are you here doing well, what you're doing? Well, you know, like, um, well, that's how I met. That's Ellen. how we met. That's how we met. <laughs> we met by, the storm of butterflies. But yeah. anyway, you know, like my my dad, he was a forest ranger, so he just retired from being in those mountains for like over 30 years. So when we met, there was nothing here. People came on day trips, people came from far away, they paid outside operators to come here and none of the money stayed in the community. So really what we've been trying to do 
with starting our business is have more people come, yeah, stay here, stay in the community, stay longer. And the numbers are much lower than they used to be in the area with the butterflies. You'd see them on the roads flying in like a river and sometimes we see that in some places but not as often as I, I think like older people talk about seeing that. I mean I've, I've only, I've been here for four seasons so in four seasons it's kind of, it, I mean it's actually gotten better, the numbers have gotten slightly better in the last four seasons but it's still you know, dramatically lower than what it was. Than it used to be. Yeah. This is lusher and greener than you might expect from Mexico. A peaceful place to see the migration. And here's a glimmer of hope for the people of Macheros. While numbers are still critically low, the signs from this year and the last is that the worrying decline appears to be stabilizing. That's all for now. Join us next time when... Rajan's at the Liwa Sports Festival in Abu Dhabi, trying to get to the top of one of the world's highest sand hills, the Morib Dune, which means terrifying mountain. Whoa, wow, hey, fantastic. You know what? I've been looking at one of the world's highest and steeper sand dunes for a while now. I really want to reach the top. And luckily, I've got myself a lift. In the meantime, make sure to join our adventures on the road by following us on social media. From myself and the Travel Show team here in Mexico, it's adios. Yeah.